Welcome to Instruction Discussion, our weekly look at the latest topics and trends in education affecting schools here on Long Island and schools around the world. Whether you're a teacher, parent, or student, listen for tips and strategies to help you navigate the educational landscape. There's a bell. It's time to start today's Instruction Discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hello, I'm Kevin Boston Hill, and welcome to Instruction Discussion where each week we will examine a recent trend or development in education and its impact on Long Island. Everyone is well aware of how much of a slide students have taken due to the pandemic. Even before the pandemic, schools and districts have been trying everything they could to help students recover or otherwise get a leg up academically, whether it is an after-school program, weekend or holiday academies, or after-school or even virtual tutoring. It seems everything has been tried. Or has it? One strategy that is gaining traction is something that has been around almost as long as time itself, mentoring. While we often think of mentoring as a way to keep young people on the straight and narrow or as a way to advance in a chosen career, when used in a targeted way, school-based mentors can be critical for students' success. Yes, we all know this and think it is an obvious solution, but most schools are not exploring this option, and not every student who needs a mentor has one. To make matters worse, not every educator knows how to be an effective mentor. To help us understand how effective school-based mentoring can be when used in a targeted way, we welcome Madeline Will, Education Week journalist and author of the article, Every Student Needs a Mentor, How Schools Can Make That Happen. Ms. Will, welcome to Instruction Discussion on 90.3 WHPC. Thank you. Happy to be here. Let's kind of get right into the nitty gritty of it all, because I think most people would definitely pretty much agree that tutoring will help students do better. Right. And they would probably also agree that mentoring can can have a dramatic impact on the lives of children. So is there any real discernible difference between the two, between mentoring and and tutoring and Is there a synergy that can be experienced between the two of them? Yeah, I think tutors can be mentors, but mentors are not necessarily tutors. Mm. Um, I think um, uh, mentors can be someone at school who can help students with schoolwork, but it can also be someone who helps um, motivate students, helps encourage them, um, give advice, um, and just build that trust so students feel motivated to come to school and um, do their best. Is there any difference in your research in putting this article together? Did you find that there is any research or any difference between a school based mentoring program and a community based mentoring program? Yeah, I think we were asking about whether students have mentors at school that they can trust because we the research will show that when students have an adult in their school building who they can trust, they will um, have benefits like they'll increased attendance, um, better grades, higher test scores, and just a sense of belonging and connectedness at school. Um, and so while that might be happening in community-based um, organizations as well. Um, I think it can be also especially important to have that at school too. So a student has, you know, a reason to come to school every day and has someone in the building that they can talk to. So part of the research that went into developing this particular article was a a, a study that was taken, a poll that was taken by a, a, a bunch of students. I think it was a thousand students or so. Was that across the country or just a small sampling of, of students? Yeah, it was a nationally representative um, survey of teenagers, so middle and high school students. What were some of those results? Uh, It was really interesting. We asked students if they had an adult mentor at school, um, defining that as someone who will give help with schoolwork, who will give advice on um, college and career or any guidance on any social issues. And 81% of students said they did. Um, And when we asked who that mentor might be in their school building, the most common answers were um, their teacher, uh, school counselors, a former teacher that they've had in the previous grade and coaches, um, which makes sense. But what I thought was um, really interesting was that um, when we asked the students who don't have a mentor, that 20% of students, um, 
it wasn't because they don't want a mentor or they don't need a mentor. Um, it was mostly because they don't know how to connect with adults at their school. Um, they said they weren't even sure where to start looking. Um, and when we asked them, you know, if you did have a mentor, what kind of help would you want? Um, 40%, about 40% of those students said they just wanted someone to talk to, which I think really spoke to that kind of social connection that students are looking for. Yeah, I was looking at some of those results also, and I think that um, looking at that survey, there were, I think, almost just over 25% or a quarter of them who actually said that they were looking for that mentor to offer praise to them mm -hmm. um, and to, I guess, and even to offer that motivation and encouragement, which to me seems like, well, if they, if most of the students don't need the encouragement and, and advice from the mentors, what are they going to them for? It seems like they, they kind of, instead of that general idea of that feel good type of thing, they actually, the students actually had some very specific targeted reasons that they wanted to have a mentor. So they, they were, they've been thinking about this. Yeah, exactly. Students said they wanted um, assistance with schoolwork. They wanted guidance on career plans. Um, you know, some students said they wanted or were receiving encouragement to stay out of trouble and work hard from schools. Like they wanted that um, guidance from adults. So we talked about, I guess, the the difference between the school based and the community based mentorings. And now I, I want to kind of addressing that or along those same lines, which kind of works better? Which platform works better? Would it be better to have the mentoring relationship kind of grow organically or kind of something that's I don't want to say forced on them, but something that's planned out ahead of time where you match the students as soon as they come into the school? Yeah, exactly. I was wondering about that when I um, reported this article. And while a lot of these mentor relationships do happen organically, um, experts say they they recommend that schools have a um, more targeted program um, for mentorship, um, because if not, there is the risk that some students will just kind of float on through school and they won't get that mentorship help. They won't know where to look. And typically adults um, who are who are mentoring students at school, sometimes they might look for students who are outgoing or who are really seeking their help, um, who are uh, friendly. And those um, might not be the students who really need a mentor the most. Yeah, that's what I, I was kind of thinking, that you, the students who need the mentors are going to be the ones who kind of fall by the wayside because either, I think you mentioned it before, they don't know where to look. They don't know how to look for a mentor or how to approach someone to be a mentor. Um, then you have the the teachers who are going to be mentors. They think, well, if I'm going to do the looking, I'm going to look for somebody who looks agreeable. I'm going to look to somebody mm -hmm. who isn't who doesn't need that heavy of a lift in order for me to help them and so forth. So the ones who really need our help are going to be either too quiet to ask for the help or they're going to be on that other end of the spectrum that people don't necessarily want to delve into. They're going to think they're the, that hard case, that too hard case that requires right. a lot more effort and support than they're willing to give. Yeah, I think um, that's going to be the problem. You know, I think um, sometimes the students who need a mentor the most are the ones that are, are maybe harder to mentor and, um, and maybe are not the ones going out and looking for it. But I think it's also it's not just that they're harder. I think also it may be that, again, they're just quiet. And the, right. so it's, it's those who kind of fly under the radar, so to speak, that um, we, we tend to ignore the most. I guess, what else can we do? Because we, we said that not every student who needs a mentor has one. And we know that in any school, any given school you walk into, there are vast number, more numbers of students than there are teachers. So how can we make that connection? How can we get get to have um, a mentor for every student? Right. So I, I spoke with one teacher um, in, um, she's actually a finalist for the National Teacher of the Year Award, mm. but um, she's a um, teacher in Illinois and um, her school um, came up with this program for freshmen, high school freshmen. Um, they noticed that freshmen were, um, they're high high numbers of Fs in, in the school, in that freshman class. So they would um, look at warning signs from eighth grade. So whether a student was, you know, failing their classes in eighth grade or their attendance was low or they, um, you know, were maybe going to the nurse instead of going to class, like all those indicators. Um, and the students who were raising those red flags were um, 
asked if they wanted to join this mentorship program. And most of them said yes. And every week they would meet with a mentor after school and that mentor would help them with academic goals and social emotional goals. Um, and it, it really developed some, some great relationships. Um, you know, I spoke with one of the students who went through that program and uh, she was saying that she didn't think she'd would ever do well in school. Like she came into high school thinking school was not for her. And, um, you know, she just wasn't expecting to do well. But um, because she developed such a close relationship with this teacher, uh, and this teacher was pushing her to do better, she ended up really wanting to do better. And she actually is now <laughs> thriving. She's applying to colleges and she's, you know, doing great. And um, I think it just um, speaks to that kind of consistent person in a student's life who is motivating them to do um, as, as as good as they can do. So when we think about the, the school-based person who is going to be that mentor, that person in the student's life who they can trust, who do we find that students actually go to? I know that, again, according to the survey, and you talk to any students, the obvious choices would be a, a teacher or a guidance counselor. But is there anyone else in the building who we may not necessarily think about as that go-to person for a given student? Yeah, it could be anybody, um, you know, bus drivers, um, cafeteria workers, custodians, um, really anybody in a school in the school building could be a mentor to a student. And therefore, how can we kind of build or how does a school build that culture of mentorship the, so that we have that synergy between the, the uh, trusted adult and the, the student in need? I think um, well, experts have said just having training um, available to the educators so that they know like what it means to be a mentor, um, maybe having some kind of specific program where, you know, it's not necessarily just teachers can um, volunteer to be a part of that that those type of mentoring programs, anybody in the building could, any adult in the building could do so. Um, but having those kind of concentrated um, efforts and, and just making it a priority priority for the school. Um, but I, I did think it was interesting that experts recommend um, professional development for educators um, to become a mentor because, you know, even if you are a teacher, you might not necessarily know how to mentor. You know, I was going to actually lead into, I'm glad you started there because I was going to ask, the, ask that question that it seems that many people may think that because you're a teacher, because you're around students all the time, that you kind of you have those skills that that it takes to become a mentor. But that's not necessarily true. I mean, even though the again the example that you pose with the uh, um, teacher of the year finalist, that she has those skill that skill set, not every teacher does. So how would a teacher develop those that skill set? Yeah, I think it's learning how a mentor relationship, mentor mentee relationship, is a little bit different than a teacher student relationship. Um, one expert told me that um, to be an effective mentor, you don't need to have power or control over the relationship. Um, you know, you're not coming from it as a, as a place of an authoritative place. You're coming in as kind of a collaborative um, relationship where the student feels like they can open up and talk to you about personal things. Um, and that might be a little bit different than typically, you know, teaching um, a, a bunch of students in front of a class. Um, so just having that kind of um, mindset, mindset shift, um, it could be helpful. You are listening to Instruction Discussion on the Voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. My name is Kevin Boston Hill, and our guest today is Madeline Will, Education Week journalist and author of the article, Every Student Needs a Mentor, How Schools Can Make That Happen. So if we're providing the professional development for teachers to develop their skill set in becoming mentors, where would school where would schools, I guess, get that? funding from? Or is there a place they can get that funding? How can they actually be able to to make that happen for their teachers? Yeah, that's a, a good question because, um, you know, experts have also said that um, if they have, if the school has a formal mentorship program, you might want to pay teachers a st or educators a stipend to participate in it because it is, it is extra work and it's um, can be a lot of time consuming. Um, so I think there are um, sources of federal funding out there that um, that schools can use. They might be able to use the federal um, pandemic relief money um, for now, at least. I know that is expiring um, next year, but um, there are a couple of other options um, with federal funding that states can kind of use to or schools can use to um, to make these programs successful. 
And for schools that may be considering doing this type of thing and developing a, a mentoring program within their schools, are there any what are the difficulties in coming up with a match between the students and finding a mentor for them? Yeah, it's it's tough because you do have to have, you know, a, a mentorship won't work if, if the student doesn't click with the teacher. Um, so I think um, or the teacher, whoever the mentor may be. But I think um, having just that kind of training. So, so educators know um, maybe the best skill sets to be a most effective teacher can, or mentor can help. And um, with, with some of these more um, targeted programs, um, that's, that's you know, the, the educators in the building, that's what they do. And, and they, they know how to develop those relationships with students, um, no matter where the student is coming from. In your research, in the discussions that you've had with some of the, the, the experts, is there a sense that maybe that group mentoring can also be an option? Again, since we have so many more students in a building than adults in the building, would group mentoring serve a the purpose to help alleviate some of those matches or is the one-to-one still the way to go? Yeah, I think group mentoring can definitely serve a place. Um, you know, the, the program that I mentioned earlier where um, – high school freshmen were coming in and meeting with the mentor. They also had group um, settings where the high school freshmen could um, talk with one another and they could talk with all the mentors who were participating in the program. And I think that's a, um, that has some benefits too, where maybe um, that can help with social development or, you know, making friends. Um, But also another interesting um, way that some schools are getting at mentorship is by having students be mentors to other students. Oh, I think, yeah, peer mentoring, I guess that that would Mm -hmm. be a a way to go as well. Now, again, what would be some of the the things to think about when you're developing a a mentoring program, whether it's using the the available adults in the building or in this case, using peers as, as mentors as well. Yeah, I think just making sure that the mentors feel supported in terms of, of training and, and um, uh, guidance, um, making sure that this is kind of embedded into the uh, school culture and the schedule without making it overwhelming for anyone, you know, especially educators are, are very busy right now. Um, so this doesn't, it shouldn't just feel like one more thing to do, but more so just embedded into um, the day to day. Yeah. Also making sure that the, um, you know, one principal told me that me- her mentorship program worked because the students who were mentees were, um, vol- it was all voluntary. Um, the students kind of chose to be mentored. They weren't being forced into it. I'm glad you mentioned that because I think in a lot of programs you have that schools are developing, it's almost as if it's a punishment so that if you get if you get suspended or if you're doing of you're failing your classes that now you're you're mandated to go to mentoring or or something similar to that. So is there a I guess a difference in how it's received when it's you looked at it as either being voluntary or mandatory? Yeah, I think that's the risk with mandatory that it, it does feel like a punishment or even like a stigma that, um, oh, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't want to be in this program. This seems like I'm like one of the, you know, bad kids. Like I, I think you don't, <laughs> schools don't want to have that stigma there. So I think having it voluntary can help. Um, and just making, and it makes those connections just easier to, um, to flourish. What are some of the other things that schools are doing so that they don't necessarily overwhelm the teachers or the other adults in the building who are serving as mentors? Because we know they all have a lot on their plates and they're spinning all these plates in the air, trying to keep them all afloat and, and whatnot. So now you're adding one more thing to them so so that the adults don't burn out. What are some of the, the strategies that schools are using within their own programs to ensure that they ha- they have teachers go throughout the, the long haul. Yeah, you know, I think when there is when it's not left up to chance, when it when these mentorships are not just organic, when it is a targeted program, um, educators can volunteer to be a part of it, and then that's something that maybe it's more of a passion for them, and and that can help them burn out. You know, when I was talking to the National Teacher of the Year finalist, who's really um, her name is Kimberly Radostitz, um, and it, it's uh, this is something that she's very passionate about mentoring. But she was saying that 
that is kind of what keeps her going through the hard times of teaching is working at having these close relationships with students that are outside of her content area. Um, so I think it can be very um, invigorating and, and encouraging for teachers um, as long as it's not required upon them. No, I think that's a, that's actually right. And I think, again, going back to the students and how we can get them to be more involved. Have you come across any uh, programs that have actually ask the students who they would like to have as a mentor, as opposed to, because we're going to ask them to volunteer anyway, maybe they can volunteer and kind of bring the adult that they would like to see as a mentor along so that the schools can then kind of coach them up to become the, the uh, a good mentor for them by providing that professional development. Yeah, I think when um, we know from past research that this type of mentors who are typically the ones that kind of or d- develop organically, where students are just drawn to their mentors, they are typically teachers, counselors, and coaches. Um, and I would imagine maybe people like um, uh, like uh, music directors or theater directors or kind of other extracurricular sponsors, um, but people that just have that close relationship with a student, especially about in an area that they might be interested in. And what are some of the, I guess, the uh, the do's and don'ts of developing a an effective and targeted mentoring program? I think um, having uh, maybe a stipend for for teachers, uh, experts say that can be a, a big a big do. Um, having um, making it fun for the students, um, the you know the one program. Um, for high school mentoring, they had um, like a little raffle that students would participate in every week where they could get win, you know, something small like a bag of chips or a donut or um, just, you know, a, a day pass to the local gym. But it made it made them made the students want to come to the program and it made it kind of a fun experience. Um, so having that there and then just having a, really an emphasis on um, support, affirmation, love, care, um, having t- teenagers feel like their mentor really is looking out for them, I think is important. Um, the one teacher I, I spoke to said that she would write little post-it notes um, saying, hey, good job on that. Um, I heard you got an A on your your algebra quiz. Good job. Or uh, I heard you, you know, were, did something really nice for another student in the, in the cafeteria. That's great. And just that kind of encouragement throughout the day, even if it's not related to schoolwork is really nice and and can kind of foster those close relationships. I think it seems like it doesn't, the contact between the mentor and the mentee doesn't necessarily have to be a, a formal one all the time. It can be, like you say, it can be those little drive by type of things that say, I I'm keeping my eye on you or I'm checking, I'm still checking in, I'm checking up on you. And I heard this from this teacher. So I think that's another thing that allows the student to know that, somebody has their back. Somebody's always kind of keeping an eye on them to make sure that they're they're good, make sure that they're doing well and, and not just academically. So what are some of the other benefits to mentoring that we see not just ac- from the academic side, but anywhere else that, that there are benefits? Well, students who um, have a mentor will typically come to school um, more often and they'll, their attendance will increase, which is really important. Um, and they also feel like they belong at the school and they feel connected to the school community, um, which is also also important. And then um, they, they believe in themselves as a learner. They have a, more of a sense of confidence. Um, and so all of those qualities, they're not, they, they can translate into higher academic gains, but also just liking school more. <laughs> Yeah, and I would imagine that, I mean, one of the, aside from the academic slide that schools are concerned about, one of the things that we see now coming out of the pandemic is students' mental health. And I would assume that having a mentor, having a, a trusted adult who is co- constantly checking in on them will also help with students' mental health. I think so. I think having that um avenue where students, if they are suffering from any kind of um, mental health issues that they can talk to, having someone to talk to, I think is just very important, um, especially these days. And um, having that relationship where an ed- a mentor can, you know, keep an eye out if, if the student is, is showing any kind of concerning signs um, is important as well. And I think it's really important to kind of reiterate, I think it's really important for schools and for even parents to understand that the the school-based mentor doesn't just have to be the the teacher and the school counselor or the athletic director or the athletic coach, although obviously those are the the more um, 
more prevalent ones that we see, but it can be uh, sometimes the principal can get involved as well. Do you have the the paraprofessionals, the ones who are there kind of on a part time basis? Um, maybe sometimes the the school nurse, maybe even I think you mentioned before the cafeteria worker. So our students come across different adults all throughout the the entire school day. So to kind of that's why I asked before, would it be possible to, to identify or to have the student identify who they relate to? to kind of draw that person in to be a mentor for them because they come across all types of adults throughout the course of a day that we may not think of. Like you don't really think of a student really talking um, heart to heart with the, with the custodian, but a lot of them do Mm -hmm. or talking, Mm -hmm. giving or getting advice from one of the cafeteria workers, but they do because they, they find that connection between them. So I think that's something else to, to consider when putting these programs together. Yeah, you know, you think um, maybe that's something that a principal would keep an eye on if they notice that, hey, the the school custodian is constantly talking with students and they're seeking him out and he has a great relationship with everybody. Like maybe um, if the school has a mentoring program, maybe they'd want to tap that um, custodian to to be a part of it. You know, just keeping an eye on how these relationships are organically forming and um, seeing if, if you can make them a little bit more um, targeted. I know that was one of one of the schools that I worked in as a um, administrator. That was what we did as well. We kind of looked at to see what the who the adults were in the building and who always seemed to have students around them for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And because it wasn't always a bad thing, even when students were talking to the uh, the school safety officers, it wasn't always the bad conversation that you would think it would be that they they, were, they weren't in trouble. So we wanted to see, okay, what is it about the relationships that are being developed among these students and these groups of adults that we can exploit and and have them be a person of trust that the students can go to? And I think that's what helped to really create that more of a, a, a safe space for the students when they realized that there were a lot of adults around that they could actually turn to. Yeah, I think that can be really important. And I think, you know, we we also know um, something we haven't brought up is that um, a lot of sometimes students of color will um, not have a mentor. Um, They are less likely to have these relationships organically um, develop. And um, that experts have said that could possibly be because many teachers or most teachers are white and um, they it's it's they're not you know mentor mentors might be looking for a student who shares similar backgrounds as they are or students might be looking for a mentor who shares similar backgrounds so um really encouraging all, everybody in the school community and and having that um that embedding that kind of culture of mentorship and support within the the whole building is, is I think really important. Well, we would certainly like to thank our guest today, Madeline Will, Education Week journalist and author of the article, Every Student Needs a Mentor, How Schools Can Make That Happen. Thank you for coming on to our show today. Thank you. Once again, my name is Kevin Boston Hill, and thank you all for listening to Instruction Discussion right here on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.